Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mode Stack podcast. Our guest today is Jake Jorgovin, uh, the founder of a few digital products and offerings. He's a serial entrepreneur. He continually learns, creates, and builds businesses and digital products. I've seen Jake through the, throughout the journey. Uh, at least I've known him for three years following him. Also, I'm not sure if it's uh, fair to say, but I have to say he's living the dream as a digital nomad. Jake, welcome to the Get in the Mode podcast. Thanks for having me on here, David. Well, Jake, where do we begin? I uh, know you usually have a few ventures going on in parallel. Uh, tell us what are some of uh, the ventures, uh, what are you ex excited about? Yeah, so the two primary companies I have, um, first one is Content Allies, which obviously we produce, um, we help B2B companies produce revenue generating podcasts. So we basically book interviews between our hosts who are our clients and their ideal customers and strategic partners where they show up and have these interviews, build amazing relationships with people, and we do everything else. Uh, then we actually have Lead Cookie, which is a um, B2B lead generation agency where we're basically doing outbound through LinkedIn, email, and phone. Uh, there's a lot of people in the space, but what we really do is focus on very much quality over quantity. Uh, we hand qualify every person that we send to. We've got an entire research team that does like really in-depth re re uh, research on all the leads to make sure we hit the exact right people. So. Um, those are really the two companies and what I'm working on these days. That's cool. Um, you know, as someone who's, yeah, I've seen your blogs about the entrepreneurial journey, uh, you know, how do you identify and determine business ideas uh, or ventures that are worthy of your pursuit? Uh, maybe that's a two-part question. The second part is like, how do you quickly say that this is not worth your time? At what point do you say that? Yeah, so uh, I haven't always been very good at this, and I definitely, um, last year, I think I spun up a lot of things that um, I had a few big wins and uh, a lot of things that I, I ended up having to kill or, or didn't work out. Um, but when COVID hit, I was just like, I was honestly, I was locked down. I was stuck in a different country from my wife for like four months. So I was like, I'm just going to work a lot. Uh, and I, I started a lot of things. And um some of the things I learned out of that and how I actually like evaluate these things now is I try to look at um, if I'm going to start something new, like I, I try to compare that time investment and in financial if I just invested that into growing what I have. And that's, I think, a very like important way to look at it for an entrepreneur is like there's times I think where your businesses can kind of plateau or they can be at a spot where you're like, hey, I, I'm trying some stuff or trying some new marketing thing. And like, we just got to let this ride out for three months or six months. And I've been through phases of that with my businesses where it's like, okay, like, cool, we're trying something. We just need to like, let this happen and see like if this works and learn. Uh, but I think then there's also times where you're like, okay, we've got something here, like just invest, go, go, go. Um, and so I think at the point when like, basically you can you you can clearly say if i invest into my business i know i can get those results um i think that's the point where it's like okay just like stay focused do what you're doing um but for example like last year um for content allies for like a good portion of the early part of last year i was like still trying to figure out our niche and like our marketing and stuff and it's like you can't really invest a lot when you're trying to figure out the exact offering, the persona and everything like that, which we ended up nailing by the end of the year. But it's like, if I were to go invest a bunch more of my time and money into marketing, like that's not really gonna get the results because it just takes acquiring customers in this niche, trying to serve them, seeing how that works. And so it, like, it just takes time on some of those things. Right. Um, so that's kind of one of the ways I look at it now is like, um, can and I, more predictably and safely make money by reinvesting. If so, I'll do that. Um, but at times, you know, like, uh, and like again, a lead cookie as like a lead generation company, we know there's a certain like kind of plateau that lead generation companies tend to hit. And so now we're starting to look at like, how do we maybe invest that into some other ways we can spin off parts of this business to make it into something else. So we're starting to look at that because there's not much we can invest more into lead cookie to really great, great, great return. So we're starting to look at how do we maybe take some of that invest into something new. So that's kind of the way I look at it. There's no clear thing, but it's just kind of, it's kind of like you're, you're figuring out where you allocate your capital and your time. Right. Yeah, totally. I mean, sometimes it's worthy to pursue that something that's existing, like take inventory of that first. Right. So that's, that's a great point. Uh, 
you know, as far as uh, entrepreneurial resources goes, uh, do, who do you like following? Are there any entrepreneurs or kind of books or perhaps any resources you follow? Um, perhaps give us some clues of some of your top learnings uh, from, from the folks that you follow. Yeah. So at this point, I would say I, pro like, I used to follow a ton of different people and I would consume a ton of business content. Um, I very much um, kind of scaled back on that a while back. And like literally most of the content I assume was about like synthesizers and music these days. Uh, and, um, and one of the things that I, I think the ways that I shifted is um, I, I have a business advisor, a guy named Anthony Tombolio, who's amazing. And uh, so I work with him and I guess I follow and I learn a lot from his journey. But the other way I think I shifted was I used to just kind of go and be consuming business content all over the place and trying to like learn and pick up. And I honestly found that it was like, it was like really mentally distracting. Uh, it was not good for me because like I would listen to something or I'd read something and I want to go take action. And then I'm just like all over the place. Um, I'm like one of my top skills is I'm an activator. And so I just go jump into things. So if I just consume a ton of stuff, I'm going to want to take action on it. Um, and so what I very much do now is I look at like, where am I weak or, or where do I need to like level up a skill? Mm -hmm. And then I go specifically look at that. So a few months ago, I realized I was like, I'm really, I just, my, my legal skills, like I, I hate contracts. I'm not doing good at this. I'm being way too, I'm running way too loose on my legal contracts. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go watch some courses on video contracts. I'm going to read up on this. I'm going to talk to people and like, I'm going to learn like how to get better at contracts. And, you know, a similar thing whenever like I realized a couple of years ago, like I just realized I was like not doing well with my financial management of my businesses. And I was like, all right, I'm going to go in. I just like read books on finances, um, read things like that. So that's what I very much, the way I kind of focus on learning now is like where is something some gap in my knowledge you know um, like a thing for me soon will probably be how do i get into ads and i'm going to look at like how do i specifically go learn like these tactical things and so um that's a lot of what i want to look at and I, I try to not go too wide on just consuming from a bunch of different thought leaders because I, I find it just distracts me at this point so <laughs> yeah uh, yeah sometimes the information overload is i mean especially you being an activator you know, that's, uh, I totally get that. Like you want to take action and then you kind of drop certain things that you might already have underway. So uh, that could be distracting. Uh, now you're uh, a remote company most of the time, as, a, as far as I've known, not just because of COVID, but uh, uh, working remotely all the time. Where are you based at the moment? I'm currently based in Barcelona, Spain. And uh, yeah, my entire team is all over the world, across the states, Canada, Vietnam, Philippines, yeah. uh, Egypt, like we've got people all over. So yeah, d different time zones, different locations. Uh, what is Jake's uh, secret sauce to managing remote teams and overcoming uh, team ch remote team challenges? I think the biggest thing is, um, I, I think a there's like having some level of culture and just like expectations for everybody um, is really helpful. But I think it just comes down to just like being very clear on like, what is the work to be done? And um, I don't know, like, it's just like, we've just always run this way. So it's just like the the simple thing is like, it just feels normal to us. But I guess it's like, for a lot of people, I'm realizing it's challenging. But I mean, for us, it's like, hey, we're gonna, you know, do some training, and then like, you'll do the work and we check in. And then it's just kind of, um, you know, we will either track people's time or we track the deliverables that they put in place, but it really just comes down to good systems. But w what I find really interesting is that there's like amazing retention with like remote work. And if you do it well, where people have freedom, they love it, like they get flexibility, they can kind of do the work whenever they want. Um, and so I think it just comes down to making sure you have good systems for it all. Um, and then just trying to make sure you have good communication. I think one of the things we do, we do weekly standups to get everybody on the call, just talking with each other, um, which is super helpful um, for team members that are uh, doing much more like heavy critical thinking work. We do a lot of one-on-ones. So um, like I do one-on-ones with a lot of my team leads and stuff like that each week. And uh, those are just really important because if you're working really closely with someone, um, you can easily 
misinterpret Slack information. Like, you know, it's like, I, I like, I'll just be busy and I like write a short response to someone and they're like, oh, is he pissed at me? And it's like, no, I'm just like, I'm just, you know, and like that's what happens if you like, you, if you're just communicating and you're not occasionally th thinking as humans, um, at least in for like a period until you get to know each other more and understand those. So I think that that's where like a lot of interpersonal stuff can come up through Slack. And so just having one-on-ones um, to connect, having time to actually talk as a team, um, and then just make sure you've got really great systems, great training, um, stuff like that. But I mean, like we, we do so much with loom videos and just like, we, like, we just fire around so many loom videos in our company. It's, it's unreal. Like they are, we are, we are power users of loom. Um, but all those kind of things just kind of are just some of the ways that we make it all work. Yeah, and I think you mentioned Loom, which is a great tool for asynchronous communication, right? So, you know, especially when you have folks in different time zones like you have, um, mm -hmm. you know, a video and a screen share speaks volumes with audio than just kind of a Slack message or an email, uh, for sure. I mean, even though email is asynchronous as well, but at the same time, you know, Loom's, is, Loom's such a great tool. So... Um, you know, having the right tools, uh, kind of creating that culture, being intentful about communication, right? Uh, so we use a lot of different tools. We use Asana, uh, Lead Cookie a lot. Um, we've used tools. We used to use Trello a ton. Um, we use Airtable a lot. And um, and now one of the tools that I'm just loving is Process Street. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that that is honestly like uh, it's probably one of the hardest skills about running a remote team is how is learning how to use these remote and like project management tools and finding the one that is fits your needs um, and does it really, really well. And so like eventually like we learned like, okay, like Asana is good for project management stuff. So if you're not doing really repeatable work, Asana is good for assigning tasks to each other, but it's really bad when things become like very process driven, um, which is um, I actually did an interview with the founder of Process Street and he like really kind of clarified this, but like Process Street is amazing whenever like, you want to create top-down processes for your team to follow and stuff like that. Um, and whether you choose those tools or something else, but like, I think that that is one of the keys to really making a remote company work well is like figuring out what is the tools you're going to use to organize it, right. um, picking the right tool and then actually getting your whole team to buy in, adopt it and stuff like that. Cause I'll tell you like where things are get horrible is when you when you start with if Slack is your tool, that's like that is a recipe for disaster. Uh, <laughs> it's like Slack is meant for conversation, but if like if you, if like part of your process involves sending a message on Slack to each other, like you're setting yourself up for a disaster because like it's gonna get lost, and so it needs to be like Slack's where we chit chat about things, but everything surrounding the work we do happens outside of that. Um, and that is, I think, uh, one of the biggest learnings that I've had whenever, whenever we built processes around Slack, they just broke down. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned an interesting thing too, like adoption, you know, adoption is something huge for a lot of these companies that are doing remote tools as well. Like, you know, likability, well, who likes what and, you know, dislikes, uh, ha have you had those type of challenges at all? Like, how do you, um, you know, do you guys have some kind of a consensus? T tell us a little bit about how you approach that. Yeah, it is something where, um, as your team gets bigger, it's like a lead cookie. Like I just, um, I'm not as involved there, but I just want to come in with an iron hammer and like, just <laughs> like enforce process street down their throats, but they won't let me, uh, there's too, there's too many that are against me. Um, uh, but at Content Allies, like I actually, um, this was actually, it was actually a challenge. Like um, I had an ops person who was very against rolling out Process Street and I eventually had to let her go. Um, and she was like giving me tons of pushback on this. And I was like, no, like this is where we need to go. And rolling that software out has been the best thing we've done for the company. Uh, like I, I literally, I told him, like, I was like, we replaced a $5,000 a month ops person with a software that we're spending less than $200 a month on. Um, and so it, there is that, and I think sometimes like that, uh, adoption piece, like people are scared of change. Cause like you, it's really crazy. Like everyone talks about the whole blockbuster anecdote, but like, it still is so easy to happen. Even like a small company where people are like, Whoa, well, like, don't, don't want to mess up their stuff or like, I swear it's going to be better, but they're like, I don't, I, 
I don't want, I just don't want change. And like, it's like, it's so crazy to like, see it happen. Even like, like a small company where like, we have like 20 people and like, they're like, you can't take a sauna from us. You know, it's like, <laughs> and it's like, it is like, but it's like, really, it's going to be better. So it's, it is a behavioral thing. And, yep. um, I think it comes down to making sure you're educated. And then what I just did is like, I just, um, I have to kind of like, you have to drive it and just show them and like start implementing it. And then yep. like, make it work yourself. And so that's what I had to do kind of to get it really to drive it into to content allies. And we're, we're, we are driving it into lead cookie at the moment. So right. <laughs> yes. uh, good challenge to have, but at the same time, I think those approaches do help. I think, um, you know, uh, going back to my earlier question of, you know, one of the things about serial entrepreneurship, um, you know, when you uh, validate quickly validate your value prop fast, you know, what are some methods, perhaps like if you have learned from your past, uh, you know, things where you may have like, okay, this is not worth pursuing. What What are some learnings? What are some methods you use to say, you know, when is it a good time to pivot or change? You know, can, can we, can you talk about that? Yeah, it's, um, it's something where like, I think it becomes clear if something's not working at all. Like those, I think, become clear. I think the hard parts are when something kind of works, but it's kind of like pushing a boulder up a hill. Mm -hmm. And that's like, and like, there's just a, it's like a thing. And like, so like I experienced this with content allies for a period of time. We, we had about a year and a half before we shifted to becoming a podcasting company where this was our focus. And like, that's where things really worked. But for a year and a half, we focused on this idea of like, hey, we're going to interview people and then create kind of like audio and video and written content. So our goal is to like extract thought leadership out of people. And it was this really cool value proposition. And honestly, like it was crazy is like, it got amazing results from cold outbound. Like people loved the concept, but our sales conversion was low, wasn't terrible. So we were closing deals and we were closing just totally cold outbound deals, which is like, to my mind, I'm like, if you're closing stuff cold, like that's great. Awesome. Uh, cause cold, like cold sales is super hard. But, um, then we was like, there was all these challenges and the delivery of it and stuff like that. And all the like clients, like fulfilling their commitments. And so, um, it was just this thing where it was like, we did that for a while and it was like, it's kind of working, but it's like pushing a boulder up a hill, customers are churning customers. It's a lot of work for them. Like there's all these things that you just start to see where you're like, God, this is like hard <laughs> and it, it shouldn't be this hard. Um, and I think that that is the, 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 the difficult one. Like, I don't think it's, it's hard to pivot whenever you're like, okay, nothing's working. Like this clearly right. isn't working. We've been trying this for a few months. Nothing's working, but when everything's kind of working, like you're making sales, people are buying it. You've got some people that love it. Um, like that, I think is where it gets tricky. Um, and I think it just kind of comes down to trusting your intuition there. And like I said, at some points you got to just, um, I would try to like make a move. And so like within that year, like we shifted from consultants for thought leaderships and then we were like, okay, no, like maybe the problem's the persona. And so we kept the same offer, but then we started going to B2B like company, like bigger companies. And we were like, okay, we're, 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 we're kind of getting it, but like, we're still getting all this pushback. Um, and so like, it's the offerings, the problem. And then it's like, okay, that's like, let's try the different offering and stuff. So it's, um, I think it just kind of comes down to trusting your intuition there. But I do think anytime you're going to like considering a pivot, you've got to give something a few months at least to see like, is this new approach working? Cause I think sometimes stuff takes time, but. I think also whenever you hit it, you know, pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and that I think was the thing, like whenever it was like, okay, like we started to see the signals for podcasting and like, we make the shift and it's like, cool, th like tripled our business in like, in like three months. And it was like, all right, that's awesome. So that we, we nailed it <laughs> that's, that's and that that's, I think, and so I think, you know, when you hit it, but I don't think you know when you don't hit it. And, and that's, I think the harder part. Great. Now, uh, you talked about thought leadership. Let's get into that, right? So lately, you've been a big proponent of it. Uh, what are some ways to promote? You, you know, what are some ways that thought leaders are promoting themselves? And what what have you found that's working, not working when you when you look at them, observe them? Yeah, I think like the biggest thing is like there there 
the mediums I think are changing to an extent. Um, I think like the ebook trend is kind of like, it's kind of dying. Um, and I've, I've been hearing people kind of talk about this where like, that's just not as a big of a thing anymore. Like put up an ebook, give it away for free. It might still work in like this internet marketing world, but it's just like not as much, um, or at least not as effective for like B2B companies. Right. Um, and so I think like when we're looking at like B2B companies for like thought leaderships, I think your avenues are LinkedIn content is definitely one of like getting out there in the LinkedIn feed. It's phenomenal. Like it just leads to this natural organic inbound referrals, stuff like that. Um, definitely podcasting is a phenomenal one. Appearing on other podcasts, hosting your own podcasts are amazing ones for thought leadership. Um, I definitely am like a big believer of the power of hosting your own podcast is you can then use that podcast to network with other influencers, network with other thought leaders. Um, so for example, like I've been um, interviewing a bunch of software trade associations and um, using that as a way to build relationships, which has allowed me to do content with them. Some of them I'm, we're becoming an official sponsor of um, things along these lines. I've also in, interviewed like really great potential referral partners, everything along those lines. Um, and just like a bunch of, um, really cool relationships that come out of that. And I think that like really like thought leadership, you know, there's like sharing all the content, but if you really want to be perceived to that, it also comes down to like rubbing shoulders with the right people. Right. Um, and it's, there's the whole kind of like social perception. It's like, put your face next to a famous person and everyone thinks you're famous. <laughs> uh, and it is like, but it's really, it's true. And it's like crazy where like, you just start doing that and like, uh, enough and, um, as soon as you're like, oh, I've, I've interviewed these really big people, then it becomes this thing where like, it's this trigger that people start to perceive you that way. So, um, I think like those in like, obviously like blogging and writing is still a super powerful channel. Um, I think it's harder, more work for a lot of people, unless you really enjoy writing. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's another just, you know, phenomenal channel that I think can go in there and, um, there's all just different ways to go about it, but. Um, I think it's just about putting stuff out there, being a voice, speaking, putting out, you're not being afraid to put your ideas out into the world. Yeah. Um, you know, can you speak of anybody who does that really well? Um, how, you know, maybe you've observed them benefiting from such efforts, uh, who, who comes to your mind? Yeah, I guess one that comes to mind would be, I guess, be like Nathan Barry of ConvertKit. Um, right. I guess just, I mean, that guy just, he just shared his journey and taught what he knew along the way. And like, it's just been really cool to see his journey. So I guess I feel like an entrepreneur, I, I don't follow all of this stuff, but I, I, his journey has been really cool to see of him going from like being a graphic designer, writing some eBooks, starting to build some software products. And now he's got ConvertKit, which is just like become a huge company. And so I think that that's someone who I think has done a great job of just, you know, putting, putting his ideas out into the world and <clears throat> building a following around that. And then out of that, you know, like building a, a great business out of that. I think Matt Eliason of Growth Machine is another person who's done something very similar, just like built a phenomenal personal brand. And then off the back of that, like launched a bunch of different businesses as well. So I think that those are some really interesting angles that people have taken on it. It's great. Uh, Jake, really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for uh, being on our podcast. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on here, David.